Hello, good morning and welcome to the Village Church Online. My name's Johnny, I'm the pastor of the Village Church and whoever you are and wherever you're watching, it's great to have you with us this morning. We're really pleased that you've tuned in. As a church, we're looking at the book of Revelation this term. Revelation is a revelation. It was revealed to John. John was given a series of visions from God. And the first vision back in chapter 1 is a vision of Jesus Christ. It's a portrait of Jesus. And the different parts of the portrait tell us different things about him. So, for example, in chapter 1 verse 13, Jesus is dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet. Revelation was written during the time of the Roman Empire. And in the Roman army, the longer your robe, the higher your rank. The highest ranks wore the longest robes. If you saw someone wearing a robe down to their knees, they were important. But Jesus is dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet. Or in other words, there's no one ranked higher than Jesus. Jesus is in command. Jesus is in charge. Jesus is in control of all things. Or in chapter 1 verse 14, the hair on his head is described as white like wool. And that could be a picture of his wisdom. Jesus controls all things, including our little lives, with perfect wisdom. But this white hair also tells us that Jesus is God. In the Old Testament, God is called the Ancient of Days, and the hair on his head is described as white like wool. And so, in other words, Jesus is God. Jesus is one with the Ancient of Days. There's no one above him. There's no one before him. All power is his. All glory is his. And whatever your week has been like, however you're feeling this morning, our God is the Ancient of Days. And we can trust him. And so as we start our service this morning, let's have a moment of quiet. A moment of quiet perhaps to pray, to ask God to help us again to trust him. So let's have a moment of quiet. We're going to sing our first song, a song called Ancient of Days. Let's sing together. Oh, mm-hmm. 
chapter 2 and chapter 3 of Revelation there are seven letters. They're letters from Jesus to seven different churches. We've looked at four of them so far and this morning we're looking at the fifth. But in most of these letters as well as commending them Jesus confronts these churches. Most of them are challenged by Jesus and he calls them to repent or to turn around. One church lacks love. They're hot on deeds, but cold on devotion. And Jesus says to them, repent. Another church is compromising. They're soft on sin. And Jesus says to them, repent. Another church is tolerant. Tolerant not in a good way, but in a bad way. They're tolerating serious sin. And Jesus says to them, repent. And it may be that we too as a church need to repent. Or it may be that you as a Christian need to repent. Maybe you've been soft on sin this week and you need to turn around. You need to turn back to Jesus. Well, that's what we're going to do now. We're going to pray what's called a prayer of confession. The prayer should appear on your screen. In a moment, we'll pray it together. But before we do that, let's take a moment to read it through on our own. Let's read this prayer of confession through on our own first.
Let's pray this prayer together. Merciful Father, we have strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the schemes and desires of our own hearts and have broken your holy laws. We have left undone what we ought to have done and we have done what we ought not to have done. Yet, good Lord, have mercy on us. Restore those who repent according to the promises declared to us through your Son, Jesus Christ. Grant, merciful Father, for his sake, that from now on we may live godly and obedient lives to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In all the letters in Revelation 2 and 3, Jesus does declare promises to us. In all the letters, he says, to the one who is victorious, which is another way of saying to the one who repents. Jesus says to those people, I'll give you this or that. And here's one of his promises. To the one who repents, if you've repented this morning, if you're living a life of faith and repentance, Jesus says to you, Jesus says to me, I will give you the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. You and I, we don't deserve that. But to people like us who confess our sin, Jesus gives us forgiveness. And Jesus will give us forever eternal life in a new creation. We don't deserve that. It's a gift. It's all a gift. What a gift. What a giver Jesus is. We're going to sing again a song called Now Why This Fear and Unbelief. So let's sing this together with understanding.
Let me say another hello, good morning and welcome to the Village Church Online. It's great to have you with us. I hope you've had a good half term, especially kids and youth and parents and teachers will be praying for you this coming week as you get going again. This morning, as I've said, we're looking at the next letter in the book of Revelation and we've got Steve Wilmshurst preaching to us. Many of us know Steve, but if you don't, Steve is a good friend of the Village Church and a great preacher and we're really grateful that he's taken the time to prepare a message for us. We're looking forward to him preaching. And if you enjoy him this week, the good news is that he'll be back next week too. So we're really grateful to Steve for this week and next week. After our service this morning, as usual, we'll be on Zoom, but we'll be doing something a bit different. A couple of weeks ago, the members of the Village Church affirmed Ben and Jace as elders, and we're going to acknowledge that this morning. It's a big deal for them, and it's a big deal for us, and so it would be great to have you on Zoom with us for that, if you're able to make it. This week, on Tuesday or Wednesday evening, it's home group. On Thursday morning, it's our short prayer meeting, half an hour or so from 7am. On Thursday evening, it's Christianity Explored. On Friday morning, it's Women's Bible Study. On Friday evening, it's the Village Youth. And if you'd like to know a bit more information about any of those things, then do get in touch. You can get in touch with me or you can get in touch with us using the email address on the screen. Contact at vcemersonsgreen.org. Kids. Sunday by Sunday, we're looking at our need for Jesus. We all need Jesus, however old we are, however young we are. And this morning, we're going to watch a short video about how we need Jesus to win for us. We need Jesus to win for us. I'm sorry to say this, but kids, you're all losers. You're all losers. And so am I especially when it comes to life and death. But Jesus is a winner, and he wins for people like us. And so we're going to watch a video about that. We'll then sing a song, and you may or may not know it, but I'm sure you'll pick it up pretty quickly. After that, we'll pray, we'll read the Bible, and then Steve will preach to us. But here's... Part five of We Need Jesus. Two men lived alone among the graves of the dead, with evil spirits in charge, bringing them harm ruling the thoughts in their head. Dangerous men lived alone among the graves of the dead. People stayed far away because they were afraid. They're out of control, people said. Scary men lived alone among the graves of the dead. One day Jesus came near without any fear. He brought friends to visit instead. Strong men came out to meet him through the graves of the dead. Hey God's son, we know you're the one. Don't hurt us, don't hurt us, they begged. Evil spirits controlling the men among the graves of the dead. They knew Jesus was boss and evil had lost. Send us into the pigs, Lord, instead. Evil spirits panicking now, looking for something to rule. They pick the pigs and ask Jesus for this. They need his permission. How cool. Evil spirits banish now. Jesus speaks and tells them to go. They head into the pigs and straight off the cliff to be drowned in the water below. Two men, free and at peace, new life from the graves of the dead. 
they are made whole, lives under control, but some watching were starting to dread. The town now come to meet Jesus. Please leave us, the people all said. We see that you win, but we'll stick with our sin. Reject Jesus and take evil instead. One man rules in this story. Who is the strongest man here? It's Jesus, God's son, the all-powerful one, when we're with him, there's no need to fear. If you stub your toe when you get out of bed And you slip in the shower and you knock your head If you miss your brekkie and your bike tires flat If the dog eats your lunch and you step on the cat Remember the Lord oh, Remember that He is in control Remember the Lord oh, He's watching His children He cares Remember the Lord, oh, oh. If you get to school about a half hour late and the principal meets you at the gate, if you can't remember one plus two and you busted for something that you didn't do, remember the Lord, oh. Remember that He is in control. Remember the Lord, Oh, he's watching his children, he cares, oh, remember the Lord, oh, oh. If your dad is crusty and your mum's in a flap, and you spill the custard in your sister's lap, if you're sent to bed and you don't know why, and you can't get to sleep, and you just want to cry, <laughs> Remember the Lord, oh, remember that He is in control. Remember the Lord, oh, He's watching His children, He cares, oh, remember the Lord, oh, oh. <laughs> You're hitting the skids and you're up the creek If you're down and out and things look bleak If you're in the pits and you're out for a duck If you're long in the tooth and short of a buck Remember the Lord, oh Remember that He is in control Remember the Lord, oh He's watching His children He cares, oh Remember the Lord, oh, oh. Good morning, Village Church. We're going to spend some time praying together now. We're going to thank God for his greatness. We're going to say sorry for the ways that we reject him. And we're going to ask for his mercy on this world, on this nation, and on the Village Church. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for your awesome majesty and perfect holiness. We thank you for your steadfast goodness and unending love. Thank you that you are the source of all light and life and truth. You spoke and time began. You spoke and the galaxies formed. You spoke and the earth was made. You spoke and life began. You spoke and created man and woman in your image made for a loving relationship with you, our Father. Thank you. But Father, we recognise that we have turned away from you and from your light and truth. We're sorry for the countless ways we reject you every day. We're sorry for our pride in our own performance and possessions. We're sorry for being so distracted by our worries. 
that we don't talk to you or listen to you. We are sorry for the people and the things that we worship instead of you. We are sorry for doubting that you can help us. We are sorry for doubting that you love us. And we ask for your forgiveness in Jesus' name. And Father, we thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he lived a perfect life here on earth. Thank you that he died and rose again so that our relationship with you can be restored. Thank you that because of what Jesus has done, we can come before you, the awesome creator God, with our prayers and requests. And Father, we ask today that you would have mercy on this world. We pray for those in positions of power, that by your grace they will make wise decisions that protect the poorest and most vulnerable people in the world, especially in the midst of this pandemic. Father, may rich nations like ours do more to help those who have nothing. May we be generous with vaccines and money. May we do more to care for your creation. And most of all, may we use more of what you have blessed us with to support your church across the world. Thank you for our connections with your church in Kenya, in the Philippines and in Indonesia. And please bless our brothers and sisters seeking to grow your kingdom in those places. May we be faithful in our support and our prayer for them. And Father, we pray now for our nation. We pray for leaders at every level who are trying to make the right decisions about public health, education, travel and work. Please give them wisdom and please give us patience. Thank you that we have so much to be grateful for in our National Health Service, our teachers and our public servants who are doing so much to protect and care for us. Thank you too that churches across the nation have found ways to keep meeting and we pray that the light and the truth of your gospel will continue to change hearts across this country. And Father, we pray for the village church today. We particularly remember those who are sick and suffering physically or mentally at the moment. May we love and pray for them as our brothers and sisters and may they rest in your sustaining grace and may they know Jesus with them each and every day. Father, we pray that Village Church will bring light and truth to our community. Help us to wake up to our calling in Jesus. May we be a church that remembers your teachings and holds fast to your truth. Help us to turn away from our sin and to lift our hearts and our eyes to the glorious victory that Jesus has already won. And Father, we thank you now for our brother Steve for the blessing of his preaching over many years. And we ask that you would give us ears and hearts to listen as he opens your word to us. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Today's reading is from Revelations 1 to 6. To the church in Sardis, and to the angel of the church in Sardis write, the words of him who has seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Yet you have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not sold their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen. Good morning. It's great to be with you at Village again and opening God's word together. So let's do that now. Uh, Revelation chapter three, uh, verses one to six, um, the letter to the church in Sardis. Now, what's the best church you've ever been to or ever heard of the best church? What, what was it? Perhaps you would think of some towering cathedral like Wells or the Sagrada Familia in Barcelona. 
its architecture soaring skywards as if to whisk you to heaven. Or maybe some vast auditorium, a, a mega church with crowds of thousands and the walls covered in giant screens showing the speaker. Uh, or perhaps you're more of a geek and your vote would go to the church with the best online offering during lockdown, uh, the best synchronised music group and the smoothest changeovers. Or again, uh, maybe you value human relationships a little bit more. Uh, that friendly place you always drop into on holiday uh, or, your, or where your parents go, uh, where they're always so pleased to see you when you visit. Maybe in your mind, the best church of all is village. Fantastic. Johnny will be so pleased. But how do you decide? What should we go by? Well, when we come to look at the letter from the Lord Jesus to the church in Sardis, these questions become very pointed. Because this church in Sardis has a great reputation, a great name. And yet its proud reputation turns out to be utterly false. And this letter contains deadly warnings for us as a church, but along with the warnings, the brightest of promises. We've now reached number five of the letters to the seven churches in what we call southwestern Turkey, but in those days was the Roman province of Asia. We began with that awesome vision of the glorified Lord Jesus back in Revelation chapter one. And now, as we move on through the letters which follow, we've seen how elements of that first vision reappear in each one as Jesus introduces himself to the church. We've seen how the letters follow a pattern. There's this introduction, a description of the strengths and weaknesses of the church, and then warnings and promises for the future. And a closing challenge to listen to the message. Every church is different. The book of Revelation paints a picture of a battle that the whole church is fighting all over the world and down through the centuries while the seven letters at the beginning remind us that every local church has its own local battles to fight, just as we do nearly 2,000 years later in Emerson's Green. And the letters remind us that the Lord Jesus loves churches. We've seen how he holds them in his hands, how he walks among them. The Lord is here among us today, even as we meet virtually. He is among us. And so we come to Sardis, quite a wealthy city, a comfortable city. It was centred on a, a citadel that stood on a spur of the mountains with steep cliffs on three sides, a little like uh, Minas Tirith for Lord of the Rings fans. And then the rest of the city down below on the plain. And we'll see how once again that the character of the city comes out in the letter. And here is the key point of the letter to Sardis. Four times in this letter, we have the word name. The English doesn't always translate it as name, but in, in the Greek, the, the same word is used. Have a quick look with me. Verse one, you have a name that you are alive. Reputation, a name. Verse four, you have a few names in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. Verse five, I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life. And I will acknowledge that name before my father and the angels. Do you see the point? The Sardis church has a great name, but is it true? Do you fit the name that you lay claim to? Are you for real? Yes or no? That's the question for us and for our church. Now, the letter falls clearly into two parts, and this is how we're going to look at it today. First, the church that's asleep, and second, the faithful few. So, so let's begin with the church that's asleep. Look again at verses one to three. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, these are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. 
Wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what time I will come to you. See this greeting from the Lord in verse one, echoes of the greeting to Ephesus. In fact, we will see that the Ephesus and Sardis letters have other points in common too. The message of the intro, the Lord is always with them and it is only his spirit that can give them the power to be truly alive. The seven spirits or the sevenfold spirit, meaning that the spirit, the Holy Spirit is present in each of the churches, but that is specially emphasised here because he's the spirit of life. And those familiar words, I know your deeds. And we saw last week with Thyatira and we'll see next week with Philadelphia that, that that can be a very positive message. I know your deeds, but not here in Sardis. Because you see what follows and this is devastating. You have a reputation, a name of being alive, but in reality you are dead. Well, everyone else may think you're great. Vote you as the best church ever, their favourite. You yourselves may think you're fantastic, but I, the risen Christ, the Lord of the church, I know better. Human approval. Yes, you have that. But divine approval? No. Devastating words. In the next verse that the Lord says, I have found your deeds unfinished or not completed. Now, now this is not about working for their salvation. Hard work, good works will never save us. We know that. The point is that the deeds this church does are coming from the wrong place. They're not coming from the power of the Spirit. They are simply feeding their reputation. They are activity, but they are not spiritual works. Do you remember the story of the fig tree in Mark chapter 11 from last year? The tree that is full of leaves, covered in leaves, so it looks very much alive, but it has no fruit. And Jesus takes that tree, takes that fig tree as a picture of what the national religion has become. And he curses it because it's not producing any spiritual fruit. That's what Sardis is like. May look alive, may look great, but it produces nothing. So it might as well be dead. Its fine reputation is worthless. This is the, the diagnosis then. When you're ill, that's the first thing you need, an accurate diagnosis. I was up at Southmead this week because I've been uh, feeling some pain in my shoulder uh, and I was having an ultrasound to find out what was going on. And after a few minutes, there was a, a detailed picture of the inside of my shoulder up on the screen and a confident diagnosis. And don't worry, it's nothing too serious. But in these letters to the churches, we have the diagnosis of the ultimate physician whose sight goes deeper than an ultrasound and further than an x-ray. And this is what he says to Sardis. Sardis, your problem is that you believe your own publicity. You are so complacent, you think all is well, but it's not so. Your church is as good as dead. Not for the first time in these letters, we hear an echo of their city's own history and situation. Remember that citadel, that fortress at the top of the cliffs? It should have been impregnable. But in the history of Sardis, not once but twice, that citadel was captured by an enemy because the defenders were asleep on the job. They set no guard. And so the city fell to the enemy. You see how pointed the Lord's command is in verse two, that that sleepy laziness, that deadly complacency has infected the church. Wake up, wake up and strengthen what little life still remains before it dies 
completely. Because you're not true to the name that you claim. Can we be any more specific about the problems at Sardis? Well, this is only this is one of, of only two churches where there is no mention of any struggle or persecution. No one is giving them a hard time here. This church is innocuous. It's not worth persecuting because evidently it has blended in with its pagan surroundings. Plenty of activity, a fine reputation, but disturbing no one. So that's the diagnosis. That's the problem. What is the solution? Wake up. Yes. But what does that mean? Verse three again. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what time I will come to you. You hear the echo of the letter to Ephesus. Glance across, glance across to chapter two, verse five. And uh, and you can see. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. The same command and a similar warning. Jace preached on this a few weeks ago. Repent, which is an encouraging command, because if you're told to repent, it means there's still hope. Repent, remember, resume. That was the message to Ephesus. And here it's repent, remember and hold on. If a church is in a mess like this, if any of us is in a mess like this, the place to go is right back to the beginning and say, Lord, Lord, we are sorry. We are so sorry. We turn back to you. We've been asleep. We want to wake up. We're almost dead. We desperately need the life of your spirit. Is the Sardis church going to wake up? We don't know. But the Lord again follows up his command with a warning. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what time I will come to you. This isn't referring to Jesus's second coming. That doesn't depend on the Sardis church repenting or otherwise. No, this is a limited coming in judgment. That's what uh, the Lord is talking about here. Ephesus is warned that the Lord will take their lampstand from its place, which is to say it will be the end of the church. And this is the same. The judgment on a local church that's effectively dead is the end of the church. So the Lord will come with no further warning and the church will be gone. And you see again how sharp the warning is. I will come like a thief, like those enemy soldiers who scaled the cliffs and captured the citadel when the defenders weren't watching. I will take you by surprise when I visit you in judgment, the Lord says. OK. What does that look like? Well, we need to keep reminding ourselves that, that the Lord is speaking to the church, to the church as a whole. Um, we need to keep reminding ourselves because we are very individualistic. That's our culture. That's what we're used to. We tend to take everything as applying to little me as an individual. No, when the Lord says he's going to judge them or that they're about to die, he isn't talking about individuals who might lose their salvation. He's talking about the church being extinguished, the light going out in the city of Sardis. So what does this warning mean for us? Well, for a start, don't judge a church by its outward reputation. The only verdict that matters for a church is the verdict of the risen Lord Jesus. Don't let's judge our own church by its reputation. Our goal is to please the Lord's. And let's take that a bit further. If a church is having an easy time in a hostile culture, it's not a good sign. And our culture here in the UK is increasingly negative and even hostile towards faithful Bible churches. And we're not here to win a popularity contest. That's not what the church is for. We are here to witness to the truth 
and we give that witness in love. Yes, but not so that we blend in with whatever our culture tells us is right. And we, we don't have pagan temples on every street corner in Bristol or Emerson's Green like they did in those days. But we do have the pressure of influencers and the weight of social media and increasingly the threat of the law of the land opposing our witness for Christ. And sadly, there are plenty of churches that are buckling under that pressure. Churches that might claim they preach the gospel and yet never say anything that our, our culture would object to. When they speak out, they simply say what the world wants to hear. It's important to fight against racism. Yes, and Christians should. But the culture agrees. It's important to take climate change seriously. Yes, but the culture agrees. It doesn't cost us much to join these battles. Joining those battles, in fact, just makes us look like the liberal culture around us. But ask this of a church. Is the church clear that Jesus Christ is the only way to God, the only way to be saved? And is the church clear that the Bible's teaching on sexuality and gender identity and the value of human life right from beginning to end is not up for grabs? Culture doesn't want to hear about that. And we can say it with love and tenderness, and we must. But it will still arouse hostility. We know that. If we say what the Bible says on these matters, people will be disturbed. They might hate us and express that by calling us haters. They might not let us meet in their buildings. They might even begin to arrest us. But we will be faithful. Look. Not every detail of every one of these seven letters applies to us or describes us. How could it? But here is the point where we need to take care. The question for us is this. What kind of church do we want to be? A church with a fine reputation? Bothering no one? Because spiritually it's asleep? Or a church that is faithful and spiritually alive, that is true to the name of Christ and ready to fight for his name. And my friends, if we doubt the answer to that question, the next few verses really ought to decide it. Because having looked at the church that's asleep, we now come, secondly, to the faithful few. Look at verses four to six with me. <clears throat> Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my father and his angels. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Here is the good news. Who is the Lord speaking to here? Well, now he really is talking to individuals, the faithful few, literally a few names who have not got their clothes dirty. In, in other words, they're not contaminated, that people who have not adopted the ways of the pagan world around them. But the word that's used for soiled their clothes suggests a connection with idolatry. Probably it means that the majority who have soiled their clothes have not merely kept their heads down, kept quiet. They have actually been involved in acknowledging the local pagan gods. Most of the Sardis church have done that. So they are really no different from the people around them. No one can tell they're supposed to be Christian believers. But the faithful few are different. And just look at the promises the Lord gives them. It's a triple promise, in fact. Part one, walking with Christ. In verse four, they will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. 
The one who is victorious will like them be dressed in white. Okay. During this lockdown, uh, I guess we've come to value the idea of walking with someone more than ever before. It's a privilege if someone asks, would you like to share your daily walk with me? How much greater and more wonderful when the one who asks you to go for a walk is the Lord Jesus. The promise is he will say to them, will you come for a walk with me? And dressed in white, which stands for, for the cleanness, the purity that Jesus gives us. It's a favourite picture in Revelation and basically it stands for being justified, washed clean and declared to be in the right with God so that we can enjoy friendship and fellowship with him, so that we can walk with him. That's the promise for anyone, any believer who is victorious. What does that mean? It means any Christian who perseveres faithfully to the end, as, as we've seen, it's the standard description of the faithful believer right the way through these letters. This is for you and me if we belong to him. Promise part two, permanently inscribed in the book. I will never blot out their name from the book of life. Another connection with the later parts of the book. We find these links all through the seven letters. In this case, it's the great judgment scene in chapter 20. If your name is in the Lamb's book of life, you are welcomed into God's presence for all of eternity. And if it is not, you are cast out forever. And the promise for these faithful ones is clear. Your name is in the book. And it's going to stay in the book. It will never be removed. Now, now, don't misunderstand this. The Lord is not saying if you are unfaithful, I will delete you from the book. No, remember, the keynote of this letter is, are you genuine? Are you true to the name that you claim? If you're not a genuine believer, if you're not really a Christian, your name will never be in the book in the first place. When our names are there, they stay there. The Bible talks about this in other similar ways too. In Isaiah chapter 49, we, we have the picture of God engraving the names of his people on the palms of his hands, never to be removed, never to be forgotten. It's where Augustus' top lady got the words of his hymn, my name from the palms of his hands, eternity will not erase. Impressed on his heart it remains in marks of indelible grace. My name on the hands of, of God, in the heart of God. What a wonderful picture for those who truly bear the name of Christ. If that's us, if that's you. And promise part three, acknowledged before the Father. I will acknowledge that name before my Father and his angels. Just imagine with me that scene on the day of judgment as we gather there in our millions before the great throne of God. And all around us are these like these vast stands crowded with angels, onlookers. And the names of each one of us are read out. And you hear, step forward, Mark, step forward, Jill, step forward, Dave. And there is an angel there glowing so bright you can't even look at him. And he declares with a voice like thunder, yes, Lord God, this one's name is in the book. It's written here. And there's a, there's a cheer from the stands as your name is acknowledged. As the Lord Jesus himself acknowledges your name and God himself welcomes you into his presence forever and ever. Can you imagine it? You know what? Pretty soon we won't need our imagination because we will experience the reality. Promise for the victorious is this. 
They have identified with me in this life. Now I will identify with them for eternity. Maybe you aren't a Christian at this point. Let me share this with you because this is what is on offer for anyone who surrenders to God and asks him to accept them. Anyone who is willing to turn their back on this world and its ways and its priorities and its gods and turn to the one real God, the one who sent his son Jesus to die for us. These promises can be yours if you will respond to him, if you will answer his call. And, and for my brothers and sisters here, as you listen to this, see what is being set before you. If you are genuine, if you are for real, if the name of Christ and the name of Christian truly belong to you, then you are victorious and you will endure to the end. And all this is yours. These promises are for you and they begin now. So is it not worth it now to keep going faithfully, to stand out for Jesus Christ in a world that's growing hostile? So let it be known to one and all that you belong to him. Isn't it worth it? Isn't it worthwhile? And for our church here at Village or anywhere else you're watching from, don't we want to be the kind of church that holds out the message of hope and life clearly and truly, not looking for popularity from the world, not just doing what politicians or the media would approve of, but in the power of the Spirit to press on whatever it may cost. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches.
that's the end of our online service this morning. In a few moments, we'll be on Zoom and we'd love to have you with us. Otherwise, we'll be back here next Sunday morning at 10.30. As we finish, let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we praise you because you're the High King of Heaven. You're the ruler of all. And we thank you for speaking to us this morning. Please help us to remember what we've received and heard. And please help us to hold it fast and repent. Please help us this week to think about you. Would you be our best thought both by day and by night? Please help us this week to live lives that are worthy of you as we look forward to walking with you one day dressed in white in a new creation. And we pray this in your name. Amen.